Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today. We are excited to have you here to learn more about our upcoming Hokkaido, Japan's wild island expedition. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Everyone on the line is muted. However, if you have any questions at any point in today's presentation, please type them in in the questions pane, and we'll answer them at the end of this webinar. I'd like to get started by introducing you to our presenters today. First, we have Sean Kerning. Sean is a program manager and has been with Zegram for nearly two years. During his tenure so far, Sean has traveled on board to the sub-Antarctic islands of New Zealand, explored the wonders of Reykjavik, and recently returned from scouting Hokkaido. Welcome, Sean. Hey, glad to be here. Sonia Desnick is an expedition advisor. She has been with Zegram for just a few months and is extremely excited about joining her first expedition. That's right, she'll be joining the Hokkaido trip this May. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm now going to turn it over to Sean and Sonia to fill in a few more details about our brand new adventure to Hokkaido. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, this is a real special trip for me. I lived for two years in South Korea and traveled pretty extensively around Japan. So this, this area is uh, very special. And uh, like Sarah said, I was able to go scout out some of the locations for this trip just this past fall. So um, I think you're going to have an amazing time. I am really excited to join this expedition. Like Sarah said, this will be my first Zagram expedition, so I'm really excited to uh, see what our trips are like and meet all you wonderful guests and uh, go to Japan and Russia for my first time. Great. All right. So let me just go over the route uh, that you'll be going on for this trip real quickly. So a lot of Japan cruises typically do the Sea of Japan area. We have one of those coming up in 2019. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we also have done, in the past, the Russian Far East, uh, starting in Hokkaido. But this will be our first circumnavigation of the entire island and really highlighting the unique culture, wildlife, and scenery of that island, which I think is really stunning. Uh, they have the Ainu indigenous culture, which is unique to Hokkaido. There's unique wildlife, like brown bears, that are only found in this part of Japan. And uh, really special geothermal and other scenery things uh, going on there. So uh, this is a great complement to... Uh, maybe a trip you've already taken to the more traditional Honshu island of Japan. Right, so we start off our trip in uh, Tokyo, and uh, the focus here is just an easy transition. So we have uh, the ANA Crown Plaza Hotel Narita, so right in the airport. So we can have minimal transfers. We'll have a nice uh, slow start the first morning, go out to the Asakusa district, uh, see the Sensoji Temple, as well as do some uh, street food and souvenir shopping around that area before boarding our bullet train up to Nagata. And Sean, what is the bullet train like? So the bullet train is a real special part of Japan. If you uh, haven't had a chance to travel on one of these before, uh, you're hurtling along at over 100 miles an hour through, and it just feels like you're gliding on ice. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a fantastic way to see uh, Japan. The, most people don't realize that over 80% of Japan is forested, and so it's actually a quite wild island itself, even the main island. All right. And so then you're going to start off your trip with a day at sea, which is a great way to meet your field staff and uh, the local guides that will be traveling with us for the entire trip on board uh, as a way to really get into the culture before you even make your first landing. And our first landing is Sapporo, the capital of Hokkaido. And we're going to have two tours today, a city tour, um, as well as a birding option. So we're gonna, that'll be a pretty constant theme on this trip, uh, giving you a chance to either do a natural history or a more culture-focused tour on almost every day. Um, yeah. I see that you did change the Sapporo viewpoint. Can you touch on why? Yeah, yeah. So uh, part of my trip to scout this area was to kind of go through the logistics of this uh, pretty complicated day. And there were two possible viewpoints over the city. Um, I think this might be a drone shot, but <laughs> this is the basic view you're getting. And uh, one is the top of Mount Moiwa, and the other is the ski jump that was used for the uh, 1972 Olympics. And uh, comparing them both, uh, I thought going to the ski jump, not only do you get the great view, you get the history of the Olympics. There's a great interactive museum there. So there's a lot for everyone to do, whether they want to ride a chairlift, look out over the scenery, or get into some of the events that happened back in 1972. All right. One other change we made is to switch the fish market. We looked at a couple fish markets and ended up deciding on the one in Sapporo itself as the best representative and a chance for you to go look at some of the seafood delicacies that this area is really known for. We also have a birding tour, as I mentioned. Uh, so yeah, I will touch on the, the birding tour. 
Uh, some of the species that you can expect to see in this area include the Japanese bush warbler, uh, blue and white flycatcher, the narcissist flycatcher, the black-eared kite, and the brown-eared bulbul. Yeah, so we have a, a special birding guide for you on this trip. Uh, Mark Brazil, who has lived in Hokkaido for over 30 years and lives actually in the Sapporo area. Uh, this is his backyard, and he's excited to take you to uh, a bunch of his favorite spots and uh, do some great birding on this trip. And our next stop, uh, we're getting up into some really interesting areas, Teori, Rishiri Island, and uh, Rebun after that. Uh, these are all areas that are fairly difficult to get to uh, there are occasional ferries, very limited infrastructure. So being able to come up on the wonderful Caledonian sky and we'll actually be able to do some zodiacing at our first stop, Teori Island, uh, conditions permitting, uh, to see some of the bird cliffs there. Uh, so we have one of the largest rhinoceros auklet breeding colonies in the world that will depart at dawn when we are planning our arrival. So you get to hopefully witness them flocking above you and then be able to get out in the zodiacs and see some of the bird cliffs up close. And Sean, can you uh, talk a little bit about what zodiacing is like, and do I need to pack my own rubber boots? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, zodiacing is one of our favorite activities at Zagram. It allows us to get into very special, unique places, these uh, rubber inflatable boats uh, that carry about 10 passengers. Uh, for this particular trip, we are going to do all dry landings. So we will be doing some cruising on the zodiacs, but you will not have to get off on a wet shore, so you do not need the large, heavy rubber boots for that kind of experience like you might in the Antarctic. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then uh, Baba, after the morning at Teori, we're going to go over to Rashiri Island, where you'll have a choice between a natural history walk at Himenu Hem Pond mm -hmm. and uh, a chance to do some birding as well. All right. And then the next day is another real highlight, uh, Ribbon Island, which is kind of known as the floating island of flowers. And we one of the reasons we chose May is that not only is it a way to avoid the uh, typhoon season and to uh, get the uh, best possible weather and lots of daylight for you to do your adventures, but you also get the spring bloom here, which is really magical. Um, and I think that's just one thing that Zingram does really well is getting out to unique places that are a little off the beaten path, but just real treasures. All right, and then our next stop will be up in Russia, actually. So uh, if you had never been to Siberia before, this is your big chance. Um, and it's a great way to contrast the culture you're seeing in Hokkaido with uh, the uh, cultures of, uh, that have come down from uh, the Russian experience. Um, so you'll have uh, either a cultural tour or a chance to go birding on the Sakovitz Peninsula there. Um, and I guess it's technically an island. <laughs> it's like a little little tiny uh, connection with the mainland there. Um, yeah, so that, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, and I, I was wondering, do I need a Russian visa? That's a great question. So Russian visas are notoriously difficult to get, and uh, actually we'll be coming in on a cruise ship, so we are exempted from that requirement. We'll have a special group visa. Now, the th one thing we do need are color copies of your passport to your expedition advisor like Sonia here, in order to uh, allow us to get that processed well in advance. So uh, that's one thing to look out for. Okay. And uh, I do think Sakhalin Island is uh, a real special place for birding, so maybe so you have some highlights on those? Yeah, so we uh, are offering a birding tour, a full day of birding in Sakhalin will afford us the opportunity to see um, birds like the great spotted woodpecker, the Eurasian sparrowhawk, uh, the Asian brown flycatcher, and uh, we might get lucky enough to see the stunning Japanese pygmy woodpecker. All right, Ooh. fingers crossed for that. <laughs> All right, and then we're back to Japan where we'll dock at Abashiri, and uh, we all visit uh, the first day. We have two, uh, one full day and then one half day in Abashiri, and it's there's a reason for that. These are two of my favorite tours of the whole trip. Uh, one will take you to Lake Mashu and Mount Ayo. Those are two locations that I scouted and had in the introduction video for this webinar. And uh, really fantastic formations, Crater Lake and uh, one of the, like this giant sulfurous uh, <laughs> scape that uh, comes up from the earth. And uh, one thing, those photos down in the bottom right are actually from my trip. Those are paths that I was scouting out as ways to extend your hiking experience there to get out on foot a little bit. And we also found a really nice peninsula at the bottom of Lake Kusharo where you'll be able to soak your feet in a thermal spring, walk out to a viewpoint with a hissing caldera, 
or go visit a small temple and see what a local temple is like. All right, and as I promised, there are two days. Uh, oh, no, then just that same day, you also have the opportunity to go out and see uh, Oturo and the Shirotoko Peninsula uh, by boat. So we're going to charter a small boat that can get into places that neither our Zodiacs uh, nor the, the large Caledonian sky can get into. And uh, we're going to go on a quest for brown bears as well as some of the other wildlife there. Yeah, and after this uh, natural history tour, there is an additional uh, birding tour afterwards at Lake Tafutsu and uh, Koshimizu Gensai Kan, which is the marshy uh, area by the coast. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then that night, as if there couldn't be any more that day, <laughs> we're going to have a really special performance for you. And you might have seen this in the intro video. There is a uh, Ainu performing group that's going to come on board and perform for us. So this looks interesting. Uh, why is there a laser light show in the indigenous cultural show? <laughs> so great question. Um, the person who puts this together, his name is Atoyi, and he is an absolute genius. He's a self-taught musician who found a one-string guitar in the garbage growing up, taught himself music. He still can't read music, but he's performed for the United Nations. He's uh, bringing Ainu traditional culture back to life by reinterpreting it and addressing events like the tsunami that happened and other things that are relevant to current Ainu people. So I think it's going to be really special to have this experience and then to be able to contrast it to what we'll see in museums and other experiences of the Ainu culture. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right. And then the next day, we go out on uh, to circumnavigate or go around the Shiratoko Peninsula after a morning expedition, either to Lake Abashiri, where we're hoping to get some birding in, um, or to uh, the... Uh, you can choose a more culturally oriented tour that will go to the Sea Ice Museum and Cape Natoro, where we hope to see some of the wildlife like the red fox and the silka deer. Um, so these are, uh, the sea ice is a really special part of the story there. We won't necessarily see it this time of year, but it, uh, at a latitude roughly that of Oregon, they get sea ice like you would see up in the Arctic because of the specific conditions there. And that is what feeds their rich fishery. And it's really fascinating to understand that uh, geological history. And then just the, the transfer between Abashiri and Kushiro itself is going to be one of the highlights. Um, that was where I was out in my video seeing the sperm whale. And so it's a real highlight for marine mammals. Uh, so this, the sperm whales will be gone, but the mink whales will be there the time of year we're coming, as well as a resident pod of killer whales. And there will also be some great bird life there, too. Yeah, so the other birds that can be found uh, in the various harbors along this peninsula can include uh, grebs, Auklets, storm patrols, uh, white-tailed sea eagles, and uh, with luck, we may also find a late lingering Stellar's sea eagle. Yeah, yeah. And the next day, we'll also have a great birding highlight as we get to Kashiro Marsh, and this is a fantastic wetland area, and we're going to be able to get for the birders back into a really exclusive area that's not generally open to the public to try to see some of the great species back there. Uh, and if we do not have the opportunity to uh, see, we're going to try our best to find the red crown train cranes. It's the very end of their season. Uh, but if not, there is like a captive wildlife center where they rehabilitate cranes and um, study them. And so everyone will have a chance uh, to at least see these wonderful creatures um, on their trip. So I think that's going to be a great highlight. And there are also some other wildlife uh, in the marsh? Yes, you can also expect to see um, there's the bullheaded shrike, uh, Latham snipe, there's the eastern spot-billed duck, uh, red fox, and the common poachard. All right, and uh, for people who are not on the intensive birding trip, uh, we'll also be able to include some traditional Ainu culture, so there is a great city museum that will feature some of the traditional outfits and, and uh, a description of how the Ainu people uh, made their life, and so it'll be a great way to contrast with the um, the living culture you'll see on the ship uh, the night before. All right, and moving along, we go to Mururan is the next stop. Um, so this one has uh, two great tours again, uh, a general natural history scenery tour where we'll go up to uh, a ropeway, they call them ropeways, kind of a cable car, uh, up to look over Lake Toya, um, and it's just fantastic scenery. And we are also looking at a um, cultural experience there. Unfortunately, the um, Ainu village that I visited is closing in April. So we are looking at an alternative that will be a little further, but is 
uh, even more special. It's not generally open to the public. So uh, fingers crossed we'll be able to get there. And if not, we're going to find some other great activities because that's that's what we do at Zagram. We always say due to the expeditionary nature of what we do, we're going to every day find you the best things to do based on the weather conditions and, and changing situations. So, yeah. And uh, the other tour will be uh, more birding focused. Um, and that was the, the trailhead that I scouted on, on my um, trip. There's a few birds there. Yeah, if you are looking at this slide, you see the view of the Shawa, Shawa Shinzan volcano and also the russet sparrow and the black browed reed warbler. Excellent. All right, so wrapping around to the southern tip of Hokkaido, we get to Hakodate. And this was the first port in Japan that was open to foreign trade in 1854. And so it has an interesting mix of Japanese and Western buildings. And so both groups will start off by going up Mount Hakodate by ropeway, again, that cable car to get a scenic view over the whole area, and then split off either to uh, visit some of the more cultural sites like Goryo Kaku Tower. <laughs> and uh, while well, the birders will go over to Mount Essa to try to find any remaining species that they haven't seen yet. All right, and then our next stop will be at Akita. So is uh, this still Hokkaido, Sean? So actually this is the northern port of Honshu and you'll really see a dramatic change as soon as you cross the channel separating the two. Uh, this, uh, you'll much more see the, what is more the traditional Japanese culture portrayed in our media with the uh, samurai castles, uh, a really nice one there called Kubota Castle we'll be visiting, um, an art park, and you'll have time to have free time in the Samurai District, which uh, features really historic uh, buildings um, that you might think of from uh, an old Japanese Kurosawa film or something. Uh, um, Lake Onumu for birders, so there will be, also be a birder, birding option that day as well, so uh, always uh, something for people who want to get out in the forest as well. And then lastly, we're going to return from Niigata to Tokyo on that same bullet train uh, the other direction. Um, you'll have a great city tour, check out some of the shrines like Meiji Shrine and the photo. Uh, and the birders will even get to do some uh, seabird sanctuary uh, spotting at Kasai Rinkai Park. So um, we end up at Hotel Akura, which is a great central location in Tokyo. And uh, then we'll be arranging transfers for everyone on the back to their onward destination. Now, I think one real highlight with Zagram are the people you travel with. That's been my realization with Zagram is it's going with the best people. Um, and so I was, uh, I'm really thrilled with the, the group that we've lined up to lead this tour. Mike Moore is a fantastic expedition leader. We'll keep everything running on clockwork. Lynn is a fantastic cruise director who will address any concerns your guests might have or you might have yourself if you're out going on the trip. Uh, Mark Brazil, as I said, is a uh, fantastic birding expert who has lived in Hokkaido for almost 30 years, uh, along with his wife, Naomi Brazil, so she will help interpret the culture. Um, and then a geologist, Tom Buchanan, marine biologist, Rich Pagan as well as, uh, not pictured here, Ron Wixman, who's an anthropologist, and David Wolf, who is uh, with the Vent Group, who will be uh, helping with our birding. And Sean, do you know any of these folks personally? I had the pleasure to travel with both Rich and with Mike Moore on the trip down to the Savanta Garden Islands of New Zealand. And with Sarah here, we <laughs> sang some really crazy karaoke <laughs> as we crossed the long passage to Macquarie Island. So Classic Zagram experience is karaoke on board. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, I think you're in for a delightful time. These, uh, this group not only knows an amazing amount about every facet of the things you'll be seeing there, uh, but they also really want to make sure you're having a fantastic time as well. And then, Sonia, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the ship we're going to be on. Yeah, so I will talk a little bit about the Caledonian Sky. Uh, this ship is absolutely beautiful. I'm very excited to, to get on board. Uh, like Sarah said, uh, there is karaoke in the evenings, and there's also a pianist on board. So the lounge is fun and lively at night. And I've uh, heard that the food is just exceptional, and the staff is amazing and uh, very courteous. Um, the ship was refurbished in 2012, and it does hold 100 passengers, um, and all the Ocean View suites are a generous size, from 217 square feet to 260 square feet. Um, and there's also uh, ample outdoor space for all the wildlife viewing that we will be doing. 
Yeah, one of my favorite memories from the Caledonian sky was down at Macquarie Island, where we were just offshore, and the giant colony of king penguins almost emptied out as they all came into the sea to see what was happening and they were just swarming around our ship and it was just frothing with little darting in and out uh, hundreds of penguins hundreds of yeah them. it's pretty just, incredible just magical and <laughs> that's what uh being in a small ship like this where you can quickly disembark where you can be right out on a zodiac in a few minutes is a uh, really a special way to travel all right. Well, thank you, Sean and Sonia, for that great in-depth look into our Hokkaido expedition. It looks like we do have a few questions. Um, we have one. Can you discuss the visa for the Russia portion? Apologies. It sounds like maybe our sound wasn't perfect at that time. Um, and are there any other documents required other than a passport for this departure? Right. Great question. So, the, no, the passport is exactly what you'll need. It needs to be uh, at least valid for six months beyond the trip with several pages for stamps. Uh, and we need a clear color copy of both the signature page and the photo page uh, well in advance uh, to make sure we get all the paperwork lined up for the uh, Russian visit. But it, it is a special visa for cruise ships only uh, that allows you 72 hours of access to Russia. So it is a very special way to get into Russia with minimal headache and hassle. Who knew that that could be so convenient, you know? Right. I mean, really. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we had another question. We just wanted to double check. Um, Sean, I believe you mentioned there are no wet landings on this trip, correct? So you don't need to bring boots on this trip. Correct. What you should bring are uh, light hiking boots for hiking on the trails. Uh, ideally, they'll be somewhat waterproof because we might get a shower or two along the trip. But you do not need the rubber boots, the heavy boots, uh, because we'll be pulling into small ports, uh, fantastic little ports that rarely see any sort of... Uh, tourism activity, but they all will have dry landings on docks um, as we go along this route. That's great. And we'll save some people some luggage space as well, I think. Yes, yes. Um, we had another question. Does, is there a way to extend our time at all on this trip? Absolutely. We are offering a pre-extension, and I think it might be almost sold out, but I think there's a little space left to Kyoto in the south of Honshu. And so I would really recommend this for anyone who has not been to Japan before. This will get you quickly up to speed with uh, the kind of the main Honshu culture. With think of you know the samurais, the, um, the women in the obi and the kimonos, and seeing wonderful shrines with all the tori, the red uh, arches that you walk under. Um, and actually, Lynn Craig is going to be running that portion and um, bringing the whole group directly up to the ship uh, from Kyoto. So um, I think that's going to be a fantastic way to extend your journey, especially if you haven't uh, spent a lot of time in, in Tokyo or in uh, Japan before. Oh, that sounds good to me. Um, we have another gear-related question. What gear does Zegram provide, and what type of gear and clothing should guests bring? All right, so <laughs> as far as uh, gear that we provide, we have a packing list that we supply with our final docs that tell you exactly what items we recommend for you to bring. Um, and uh, we also offer a gear credit to help people make those purchases if there's anything you're missing. Yeah, there is an $80 gear credit that comes uh, in your final documents, so you can go to our gear store and uh, purchase gear there as well. Yeah, so we, and there's a there's a link to that gear store in the pre-departure note section on our website, on the trip page, as well as a link in the footer of our website as well. Yeah, so we've curated a list of items you think might be particularly useful for this trip for you. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question about some of the touring options. If you're choosing a heavily birding option with Mark, will you still have opportunities to see some of the cultural sites? Absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned, like some of the days we'll have the whole group do a, a main activity, like in Hakodate, we all do the ropeway together, and then the birders will split off to do very specific birding activities in the forest, and the rest can go to uh, some more traditional sites uh, and temples and things like that. So, uh, And you'll also get to choose on the day. So one thing, uh, you know, we don't make you pre-sign up you know, months in advance for what you're going to do. You can, if you're feeling like getting out and doing some walking in nature that day, uh, we encourage you to do that. And if you're feeling like, hey, I'd like to learn more about these museums, um, Lynn puts together a daily program the day before, as well as a talk at the recap about what to expect the next day. And you can decide what the best touring option for you on the spot is. That's great. We do like to say that with Zegram, you can kind of choose your own adventure with between the birding or a nature hike or a cultural show. It's really what you want to get out of these trips, which is a really fun way to explore an area like Japan and Hokkaido specifically. Yep. 
Um, it looks like we have just one last question, um, which is about how many cabins are left. Is there still space available on this exciting brand new trip? Yes, there are. there's still space available. We do have seven spots left on this trip. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you again to Sean and Sonia, and thank you all for joining us. And this will be posted on our YouTube page within the next day or two, so you can come back and check more of the facts if you have any residual questions. Thanks, everyone, for your time, and we look forward to traveling with you soon. Thanks. Thank you.